Oh, Facebook. Okay. So <clears throat> thanks for showing up, everybody who is right on time. Um, I'm streaming both on YouTube and on Facebook. The audio and video quality is a little bit better on Facebook. So I'm going to try to monitor both chat rooms for questions as things come up. Feel free to ask questions at any time, and I'll go through. I also got a few questions from people who weren't able to make it to the live stream and wanted to ask questions anyway. So, um, yeah, I say, oh, it's spinning wheel. Oh, of course. New technology, right? It's inevitable. It's inevitable. Okay, how about now? I'm going to keep going. It looks like people on Facebook uh, might be having a little better connection, so I'll let the chat know and YouTube head over to Facebook. All right, so let's start right away. Um, I want to answer a, well, I can make halfway make an announcement and ask a, answer a question that I get somewhat frequently about uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, because you guys know I've been in the Bitcoin community for quite some time. And we'll start with stirring the pot a little bit. So um, best question ever is, is Bitcoin Cash the real Bitcoin? Not strictly philosophy, but very relevant um, to my work. And I think it's very important in the crypto community that we have kind of clear definitions. Um, so I get to make an announcement that I am officially writing my second book on Bitcoin, on specifically Bitcoin Cash. So I'm hoping to have it done by the end of the year. I had other things to write, but this is like kind of time pressing. Um, and it's really important, I think, if you're, especially if you're a libertarian and you're interested in crypto technology, you got to learn about the detailed history behind Bitcoin Cash. So that'll be coming out. Um, to answer the question, is Bitcoin Cash the real Bitcoin? It depends on what you mean by the term um, as the other uh, question like this. So in, in a very important sense, Bitcoin Cash could be understood as Bitcoin. And in a very important sense, Bitcoin Cash is most certainly not Bitcoin. It depends on what you mean. So if what you mean by Bitcoin is the crypto asset that is traded on exchanges under the bigger symbol BTC that most people are referencing in Bitcoin when they talk about uh, media. Oh, oh yeah, it's choppy sound again. If it's real bad, let me know and I'll, I'll pause it. See if I can figure something out here. Um, if what you mean is the the asset that is traded uh, as Bitcoin, no, Bitcoin Cash is most certainly not Bitcoin. However, if what you mean is the crypto project that was started back in two thousand nine, uh, that's supposed to be decentralized. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer electronic cash, with the same design structure as what the uh, creator of Bitcoin laid out, um, with the built-in proposition that transactions are supposed to be cheap and blocks are not supposed to be full, then yeah, Bitcoin Cash is Bitcoin. Um, so I know that upsets a lot of people, but um, it, here's here's a way where I can I can make amends to. BTC, um, friend, BTC friends like David Vexler. Um, in the sense where that really matters, which is maybe a technical definition for Bitcoin, which is majority hash rate, um, Bitcoin Cash is most certainly not Bitcoin. I think this is actually a really important definition. So uh, if you guys are interested in mining basic principles of Bitcoin, you don't know what it is. What's the big deal about Bitcoin? It's the book that I wrote back in 2014 about this, but there's a bunch of miners um, who are contributing their computing power to maintain the Bitcoin infrastructure. And the vast majority of them, about 75% right now, are still uh, putting their their hash power, the computer horsepower, on the BTC blockchain. And there was a there was a proposal by Gavin and Dreesen back in the day to say, hey, let's essentially call that Bitcoin, whatever gets the majority hash rate mining this particular algorithm, we'll call that Bitcoin. I like that definition. So in a technical sense, I think uh, BTC Bitcoin is Bitcoin for now. <laughs> I think there's a very good chance, very good possibility just in the next couple of years that switch. It 
the price power, the price of BCH, BTC switches, um, and the hash rates switches over, then Bitcoin Cash would in fact be um, Bitcoin, but I don't think we're there yet. So that I give a good, uh, a good <laughs> a controversial uh, answer to start off with. Oh, it looks like my my uh, YouTube connection is garbage. Okay, well, fortunately, here we have Facebook. All right. So next question: Howard Real asks Steve. What constitutes proof of God's existence? It's a great question, and uh, I got a similar question that I'm going to answer later from a patron. Um, it depends on what you mean by God. So, um, if what you mean by God is a person who is non-physical and has some kind of um, some kind of a connection with humans, and who maybe has thoughts and feelings and loves you. Um, I think it's going to be very difficult to make any kind of philosophic proof, any anything that qualifies as proof for the existence of God. But if what you mean by God is the deistic conception of God, sometimes called the philosopher's God, then I think you can have various proofs. One that I'm actually uh, rather fond of is um, you could call it the, cosmolo the cosmological argument, but it essentially goes like this. Um, there is no such thing as infinite temporal regress events progress chronologically. Uh, it cannot be the case that if events progress chronologically, that was always the case at infinitum. It must have a beginning at some point. Um, if it's the case that you have a beginning, that means you have some non-spatial, non-temporal, prime mover, first cause thing that set up um, the chronological chain of events that we experience. Um, and there's various versions of that, which I think are actually rather good. I think some Thing like a first cause or a prime mover, an un uncaused cause. Uh, I think those are, are necessary. That they, they might even be logically necessary. This ties into my ideas about infinity, which I'm very happy to talk about if you guys uh, want to talk about why actualized infinities don't exist. That's my bread and butter. I'll be talking about it. Um, but that's what I think would constitute a proof of God's existence. Now, I recently gave a conversation, talk, whatever, um, with a group talking about more theistic conceptions of God. Um, about you know love and and why I think there may be some kind of div supernatural quality to love, um, but that's I, I don't call those arguments proof. I think that people have personal experiences that point them in a particular direction towards maybe there's maybe there's divine orchestration out there. Maybe love is something that's super special, but it doesn't get in the realm of um, proof. <clears throat> All right, next question. Jeff Falzone asks, hey, Steve, enjoying your work very much. What are the most important limits of logic, and what happens when the limits are not well understood or integrated into one's worldview? Excellent question. And again, depends on what you mean by logic. Uh, so I wrote a book called Square One Foundations of Knowledge. Uh, if you guys are interested, it uh, explains what I think logic is, or what I, what I mean by the term. Um, so in one important way, there's no limit of logic. Logic, as I like to say, logic and existence are inseparable. So everywhere there is existence, everywhere there are things, um, you have logic. You can't really get out of the laws of logic, so there's no limit per se. Um, what a lot of people mean by logic is something like you know, real airtight reasoning. Um, uh, okay, well, just to Jeff clarify, meaning the square one's uh, core point. So if you're talking about what I mean by logic, um, yeah, I would say there's no limit of logic. There's no part of existence which does not play by logically, uh, by, by the rules of logic or the laws of logic. Um, so I don't, I think the danger is not understanding the limit of logic. The danger is not understanding that the laws of logic aren't limited or they are universal, uh, something like that. A great example of this would be a recent conversation I had with an academic uh, named Graham Priest, who's a philosopher, sometimes works at Oxford, who has the positive belief in the existence of logical contradictions. Um, he does not understand the limits of logic, namely that there are no limits of logic. Uh, and we had a long conversation, you know, he argued that the liar's paradox proves that, in fact, um, there, are, there are logical contradictions. But um, if you guys are interested in that, I highly recommend that conversation. 
um, yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. All right, so more questions. Um, pick up the one from a patron. Um, here we go. He says, I can't stay up late for your live stream, so I'll ask my question here. Time, what is it, philosophically speaking? It obviously features prominently, prominently in our thoughts about reality, but it isn't something in the world separate from us, like much of the other things we talk about. It doesn't seem to be the product, the product of our intentionality. We don't do time. We don't cause time, but it is experienced, however subjectively. The passage of time gives rise to memory of past times. You might say, I'm unhappy about myself because of the past, and yet it is past and ceases to be. The future is an idea, but future time states have any genuine claim to, our exi to, to existence prior to our consideration of them. Time is both a thing of the world and of our experience. It is both impersonal and personal. So what gives? Great question, a, a real easy one. <laughs> That's just a sarcasm. Uh, time is one of those ones um, which baffles a lot of people. Uh, I don't have a good answer. Here's my, my uh, unpolished thoughts on what time is. A time is a word that is used to describe the experience of chronological progression. So it's a way, the, the, the definitely the thing we're concretely talking about is our experiences and a, a particular nature of our experiences and how they change. So to say time is of the world, well, if you mean time is physical, yeah, I think it is, but I know that time is experiential. That's actually the thing that I'm talking about. Um, now, just to say, you know, time is something that is personally experienced doesn't really solve a lot of questions. Like, um, for example, the person said, it doesn't make sense talking about future states before they've happened. Well, yes, I think you can reasonably say, uh, I am predicting that I will experience a change in my particular mental state. I think that my experience will change along a particular dimension that is time. Um, a helpful way to think about time is, um, we're talking about physics, is as a dimension, not a spatial dimension. People talk about the fourth dimension as if it's something like you have dimension here, x-axis, y-axis, z-axis, and then magic axis. Um, think about time as a dimension, as a non-spatial dimension. Um, but it's helpful to think about it that way because we can talk about, I got a pen here, we can talk about the change over dimension like this. Um, there's, a, there's a spatial dimensional difference between the pen here and the pen here. Right at one point, at at, uh, at one point, the time was in this spatial area. At another point, the time was in this spatial area. Okay, so it's a change along a dimension. But what's the difference between the pen between now and now? There's a change, but it's not a spatial change. It is a temporal change between now and now. We can think of the only thing changing being the time dimension. So I don't know if that is. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, that's what I think time is. And I, what I would say is, given the phenomenon of the experience of chronological progression, I think we can know there can't be an infinite series of past events. That either means there's a first cause, or it means something which was suggested in the last conversation I had with somebody on this topic uh, in a group discussion, was that really chronological progression is kind of an illusion, that at the most fundamental level, everything is static. And maybe that's true. I don't know. Um, there's a chance. Maybe that's true. Okay. Next question. If you think professional academics are so stupid, then why do you keep interviewing them? <laughs> Excellent. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so there's a couple answers to that. There's uh, there's three answers. Um, two of them are nefarious, and one of them is less nefarious. The, the simple answer is to say there's not a lot of people who I can talk to about these ideas. So it kind of a if I want to have conversations about time and meta the metaphysics of mathematics, you know, you'd be dealing with a restricted set of people, and a lot of those happen to be in academia. So that's a practical answer. Um, there's a nefarious consideration, which is part of my explicit purpose of Patterson to Pursuit is to, is to demonstrate to people 
that um, professional academics might not be the brilliant bulbs that we assume they are or that most people assume they are. So when having some of these conversations, I'm trying to demonstrate in real time the shallowness of a lot of these thinkers. And of course, I don't say that to your face, um, but that is some, sometimes the ulterior, uh, the ulterior motive. I was having a conversation actually with somebody on this. And uh, I, I like to say that um, uh, my conversations are excellent, or they're interesting, and they're really exciting. And people interpret that as, oh, Steve, you think, when you say a conversation you had with an academic was excellent, it means you learned a lot. And like, you think the person's a really deep thinker. And that's not actually the case. When I say a conversation was excellent or fantastic, it's very possible that what I mean to say is, oh, what a wonderful demonstration of the shallowness of this individual's thinking. And also what a wonderful demonstration of, of the status of the academy that we have these fools who are populating it. Um, so that is, uh, yeah, that's that's part of it. Uh, it doesn't sound nice, but that's the case. Uh, and the last kind of uh, kind of sinister motive behind Patterson in Pursuit and my thoughts on academia is that um, I argue a lot with people. I get emails from people all the time who like to tell me that I that I, I haven't encountered basic ideas. So I'm talking about alternative theory of calculus or why calculus doesn't solve Zeno's paradoxes. People think I like never encountered the idea of convergence or something. And they send me these funny, it's academics. And it's ironic because they reveal that actually they are the ones that don't, haven't thought through the topic. Um, but what I can do now is send them links about conversations I've had on those topics. So when I talk about the liar's paradox, some schmo brings up how there are a lot of contradictions because the liar's paradox, as if I've never heard it before, I get to say, oh, yes, I am I actually am familiar with that. And here's the conversation I had with the grand priest, the guy that came up with this stupid idea. Uh, you can listen to it here. So it's also a way to kind of um, uh, stunt those criticisms. Okay. Next questions. Square. Uh, will you be doing a post commentary on the Thaddeus Russell debate? Anything that surprised you particularly? Good question. I definitely will be doing a uh, an interview breakdown of that interview. Um, I don't want to reveal too much. Um, I would say that I I think that might have been an example of the demonstration of incorrect ideas for my audience. Um, I. Um, I think that uh, I disagree with Thaddeus on those topics, <laughs> and uh, and I think I made a pretty clear case for the existence of some limited truth. But uh, I have a lot more to say on that breakdown later. And uh, hi, Steve. Pato says, hi, Steve. Can you talk about your ideological position uh, on anarchism? Yes, I would love to. Um, so here's what I like to say about anarchism. Um, it's a scary word, and I like the word because it's provocative, but really, my political theory is one where I don't think there should be monopolies. That's all. I think that I have a little phrase, a little, and I've, I've got to a point in my career now where I can trot up phrases where I can reuse. I like to say that um, my political philosophy, market anarchism, can be summed up in a sentence that all of the services that uh, are currently provided by governments can be more efficiently and um, ethically provided by private entrepreneurs. So whatever the service is, I think that there shouldn't be a monopoly provider of it. I think people should compete. I think this for a lot of reasons. I think it for empirical reasons that everything the government does is incompetent and could be done a thousand times better and more efficient by businessmen. I think for ethical reasons, I don't like the idea of taxation in general, the idea that there's some group of people that says you have to pay for these services whether you like them or not at the point of a gun, and if you don't, we're going to put you in jail. Uh, I don't like that, and so that's one of the outcomes of having monopolies. Um, I believe for economic reasons. I think that it shouldn't be surprising that governments are completely incompetent when you analyze the incentives of governments. When you have government 
um, market, when you have market actors that don't have a profit incentive, it shouldn't be surprising that they suck at delivering whatever products or services they're delivering. Um, they don't get punished. Police would be a great example. You know, if, if you have a robbery and consistently your house gets broken into and the police don't do anything, what are you going to do? Are you going to stop paying your taxes? Police force doesn't care. They still, the police force can be completely incompetent and they still get a paycheck. Um, versus, you know, you go to Subway and the person, you know, spit on your sub or you don't like it, they, there's no money on the line. Subway has every incentive to make sure that you, the customer, are happy. So I just wanted to see that principle applied universally. Court systems, law, all of that. Um, Mike says, he, I, I, I agree. I agree with your agreeing, Mike. And it says, what about corporations, their monopolies? Uh, it's a good intuition, but I think it's a bit incorrect. So in one sense, corporations can kind of be monopolies when they're connected to government privilege, which is actually quite often. Um, historically speaking, co corporations are kind of a grant of government, but I don't like that. I'd like to see market corporations that don't have the benefits uh, a special benefits of government. And it's not to say that corporations are somehow inherently bad. I think corporations make sense if you think about it. So imagine you're producing pens, right? And it uh, turns out, you know, you, you make a pen accidentally where the little nub here breaks off and uh, it kills some kids. You know, you know there's, there's like two kids ingested in Arizona, they die, and then they sue you for killing their kids. <laughs> Uh, personally. So that would be a scary circumstance. What corporations do is they say, okay, well, in the you're not personally liable for these types of products. You have this kind of other entity that takes on the legal responsibility. And I, I think it, I think that is can be done correctly in a marketplace. I think it can be done incorrectly in a um, in a circumstance where you have government privileges giving um, handouts to corporate monopolies, and then of course you get bailouts, and everything gets politicized. So, all right. Kyle Hodge says, you said earlier that part of the reason you do Patterson Pursuit is to reveal inaccuracies in the worldviews of academics or to expose them to shallow thinkers. That is true. Are the majority of the folks you interview these sorts of academics? Do you worry that uh, you will stop being able to secure interviews if you maintain that one purpose of Patterson Pursuit is in some sense exposing academics? Uh, that's a great question. I have always thought that there would probably come a time where word gets out and I'm like blacklisted from being inter uh, from interviewing academics. And I'm okay with that. Fortunately, I'm a ways away from that. I don't have a particularly high opinion of most academics, so I don't think they're gonna care. I don't think they're gonna do research. I don't. I don't think the academics whom I'm demonstrating are shallow thinkers even realize that I'm demonstrating they're shallow thinkers, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, I, on the other hand, you know, to be fair, I have found in my travels that there are quite a bit of academics out there who at least love the spirit of what I'm doing. I don't think necessarily tell them that I'm exposing shallow thinkers in, in the academy. But the idea of working outside the academy, doing my own thing because of the stupid anti-intellectual structure that is, you know, modern intelligentsia or the, uh, modern academia, um, a lot of them like it. A lot of them are very supportive. So I, I've got, I mean, I usually talk, well, this was more true when I was doing in-person interviews. It's less so now that it's on Skype a lot. But when I was traveling, I would talk to professors before and after the interviews, oftentimes about the academy. But I'd say, I'd say a third to a half of them, probably a third of them, were explicitly, oh, man, that's great. They, they thought that was a great idea. So, um, yeah, uh, that's, that's good news. All right. All right, let me go back to my other list here. All right, other question from a patron. Uh, what is your definition of God? Patrick asked, what is your definition of God and does God exist? Familiar with your story of being overwhelmed with love for your life, proving the existence of something beyond yourself in the universe, but I don't think you've definitively laid out your current beliefs and understanding regarding God. And to be clear, I'm not talking about a Christian God or any other religious interpretation of God. I'm referring to the conception of a supreme being slash creator of existence. How would you define such a being or thing and do you believe in it? It's a great question, Patrick. Um, and the reason I've not 
done this explicitly is because the ideas aren't sorted out as deeply as I'd like them. Um, that you know, whenever I write about something, I like to have a really clear conception before I venture out into, to, you know, putting my name out there and you know saying crazy things. Uh, and God is one of those things where you know I have a I have a bad history. I have a bad taste in my mouth from growing up as a Christian evangelical, and just the word and being in you know I'm I'm very skeptical and, and uh, it's got a bad connotation. So. I like that you make the the disclaimer, I'm not talking about the Christian God, good, uh, I'm not talking about religious gods either. Um, to define, I, I guess here's what I would say, he, 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 let me give you some unrefined thoughts that for good reason I've put into a piece just yet, and I don't know, maybe you'll find it good, maybe you won't. No guarantees of the quality of this, still working through it. Um, so in one sense, there is definitely some existence that I think is um, uh, ex external to humans uh, and governs the, the systems in which um, humans live. So I'm talking about laws. I think that there, I, I think we can talk about the law of physics. I think we can talk about the laws of logic. And I think that actually I'm talking about something. There is something there's some transcendent structure or rule system that is, uh, you could, it's, it's a kind of godly, or how you might think of like, a, instead of being God as a person, God is a set of rules that you can't get away from. That's much bigger, much, much, much bigger than a person. So I think that on the one hand, there is some kind of, there's some kind of necessary being or, or structure to existence. And I think that that, ha that is probably worthy of being called something like God. On the other hand, that, that I'm more comfortable talking about because uh, the laws of logic is kind of my bread and butter. But what I'm really unsure of and confused by is the connection or apparent connection that beings like myself might have with a mindset that you could consider a godly mindset or a divine mindset or the love mindset or the Jesus Christ mindset. Um, so it's something, I guess I could say something like this. It seems like if you could personify God, the rules of the system, the big, you know, the big transcendent thing, if you could personify it as a person, it might act a particular way. And I think it would act always in a loving way. And I think that the human mind has the ability to maybe slip into that mindset, to slip into that God mindset. It sounds transcendental and maybe and woo woo, but that's just based on the experiences I've had and based on lots of conversations with people, most of them in private, who share similar experiences to myself. So it's a part of human existence that we have this ability to, to love in this profound, profound way. And it also seems to be connected with the traditional conception of God. Um, so, so here's 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 what I would like to say. I would like to say that uh, the first cause of logical necessity, laws of logic, maybe the laws of physics, some types of transcendental laws are necessary and external to humans. We'll call those God. And there is some kind of transcendental mind that is also universal, that you have the ability to access maybe through practice, maybe through psychedelic drug use, whatever. Uh, and if I could make the mind, the being, uh, logically necessary, that would solve the issue. Because it's like, oh yeah, God exists, he's this mind, it solves all these logical problems, boom, boom, boom. I, I cannot see why, I cannot see the argument for a, a mind, a, a God mind, being logically necessary. And so if it's not logically necessary, why would it exist? Did the, did the structure of existence create a God mind? I think that seems odd to me. So if I could solve that problem, uh, I would be, I, I write something about it, but I have yet to. So I'm in this kind of ambiguous realm where there's something here, but I can't quite exactly put my finger on it. Now, also I would say, the last thing on that, um, I'm perfectly comfortable arguing for the the God of the philosophers or the the, um, 
you know, the, the impersonal God, the universal God, I'm, I'm totally not comfortable making a, a rational argument for the other type of God. So that, you know, that's the rub. So I don't know, I probably didn't answer your question, but I tried. <laughs> All right. Next question. Okay, I got to scroll up here. I have some good questions here. Uh, government granted privilege is one thing, but what about regulations? Are all regulations on corporations inherently bad? Good question. Um, it depends on the structure that you're in. So if you are in a BS political structure in which there's a bunch of regulations on the books, I mean, you know, if you've already got cancer, maybe chemotherapy is okay. Maybe. I don't know. In, in the system I think that should be created, you wouldn't have government regulations anyway. In marketplaces, you have super strict, super strong, devastating regulation, but it's all market regulation. The regulation is like, if you screw up, you go bankrupt. <laughs> if you're a bank and you lose money and you have to shut your doors, you're out of business. You lost. Uh, you go bankrupt. So there's a much stricter type of regulation that you get from, uh, from capitalism. So something like, uh, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of ambiguous examples where you say, what about this regulation, given that we're living in markets or, or uh, like um, a mixed system, do you support social regulation? And my preference is to say, look, the problem is the regulation in the first place, get the government out and, and uh, problems. All right, Jeff asks, what is the philosophic inference you make that, you, that you're most wary of? Ooh, that's a hard question. Um, so I take the approach. I'm actually uh, kind of a fan of um, Descartes' methodology. I think I'm a little bit wonky on some things. I like the intense, extreme skepticism, doubt everything that can be doubted. In fact, I'm working on another book that's going to be out a, a, a little a ways called The Mind in the World, talking about metaphysics, where I take the perspective of let's start from nothing and see if we can develop a theory of what the mind is and what the world is. Um, so in, in one sense, very basic inductive reasoning I'm very wary of. So I am not, I have a philosophy where I'm perfectly comfortable talking about the physical world and physics, of course, um, but always with the caveat that the physical world might not actually exist, which sounds kind of crazy, but I'm starting from the standpoint of what I know exists are the phenomena I experience, mental phenomena certainly exist. I'm not sure the cause of the mental phenomena. Maybe the mental phenomena are caused and correlated by external physical phenomena, or maybe it's an evil demon. I don't know. I don't have a positive belief that's an evil demon, but I can't rule it out. So, <laughs> so I'm always in the perspective of radically revising every single inductive uh, inference that I make down to the point of even the existence of uh, the physical world. So, all right. Pato asks, what do you think about the next proposition? Time is the product of the interaction of subatomic particles in the sense that time only exists as a variable because matter and energy change. Ah, uh, maybe. I prefer to say time is a word that we use to describe kind of like a progression of our experiences. Um, it, it may be grounded in something like physics. Uh, it may not. It's still an open question. I mean, there was a big question in physics. Is time absolute or is it relative? Is there any kind of the same thing with space? Um, and I'd say it's actually an open question. There's a lot of people that have thought, well, a lot of, everybody originally thought that time was absolute and then they thought time was relative. But now there's an interesting case to be made that maybe actually time could be um, absolute if we make different assumptions in physics. So I don't know. Who's the philosopher that whose views... Who's the philosopher that your views line up with the most? I have none, and not even close. Um, and I wish I did. In fact, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I agreed with anybody on anything. Um, I, have a, I have a life motto, which is also a philosophic motto, which is that everybody is wrong about everything all the time. I probably get a tattoo of it or something. Um, and I don't mean that literally. There's an exception. You know, the true statement is to say that almost everybody is wrong about almost everything, almost all the time, but that doesn't have the same uh, ring to it. Um, so I, what I, I like uh, Descartes' methodology. Um, I'm, uh, I like uh, Socrates' methodology. In fact, I really like his. He like, go around talking to the experts, demonstrating that they aren't actually experts. I, I find a lot of inspiration in that. 
Um, I think Kant might have been correct in some things that he said about the noumena versus the uh, the phenomena. Uh, so I have little bits and pieces that I resonate with, but to be honest, you know, when you when you start over from scratch, at least the worldview I'm building does not doesn't really correlate more than ten percent with pretty much anybody that I've read. Maybe that's because I don't read enough. I spend mo I spend more time thinking about ideas than I do reading about ideas because I trust my methodology more than other people's methodologies. Um, but to date, I've not found somebody I really deeply resonate with. That being said, there's one exception. There's a gentleman who I, who you don't know, who currently exists, who is in California right now, and he's doing some independent philosophy of work. Um, I was incredibly impressed by this gentleman. And in a lot of ways, we agreed on some fundamentals. We agreed on methodological things, which is the most important things to agree on, and maybe some metaphysical things that we didn't have that much time to talk. Um, so there's an opening. There's an opening here. Maybe this particular gentleman is the person I uh, most strongly agree with, but I won't tell you who he is yet. Okay, good questions. Man, good questions. Okay, I don't know all of what your plans are going forward, but if the word does get out about what purposes of patterns and pursuit, what would you likely do instead? <laughs> Assuming that the blacklisting is extreme. I appreciate the, the fact that you raise minority positions, finitism and mathematics, dualism and metaphysics in the form of long form interviews, as it would be too bad if it, if it were lost. Mm. So what would I do if I'm exposed? What will I do when I'm exposed? Um, honestly, I don't think it's going to go away. Um, I think that by that time, there will be enough of an audience where I can just keep it People that I find interesting and the you know the allure of coming on the show will hopefully outweigh the hesitation you're gonna get stuffy asshole academics that you know uh, won't come on because they don't want to give me a platform or some of that nonsense um, but screw them I don't care I think my show is gonna be much bigger than that anyway so I have no intention I mean if somehow I can't get interviews about these topics I'll just have to do it to the microphone this is stuff, stuff I'm interested in and, and it ain't going anywhere although that being said um, it might go somewhere someday, but I'm going to keep cryptic. Next question. Sounds like you've sublimated the idea of infinite sets into a wonderful psychological experience. <laughs> yeah. I've not experienced infinities. Um, I don't think anybody ever could. Okay. Eric says, give me encouragement. Facebook Live is the way to go. Maybe. 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 maybe this is going to be a regular. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Plato and Socrates branched off. I like Plato. Yes. Okay. Tom Gorman asks, Steve, do you believe there might come a time in the far future where you can, where you, when you think, I can't live long enough to answer these questions, therefore I'm just going to assume a stance of trust, dare I say faith, in some set of beliefs that at least seem to work for me? Excellent question. I was just thinking about this. Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot recently, but and today too. I would have said that I would have thought prior to this pursuit that I've never, you're not going to really arrive at a destination. It's kind of an, it's you know, a Patterson pursuit of truth that is just out there. To my surprise, I, I find that's not the case at all. In fact, I'm coming to a crap ton of conclusions about really hard things and making a lot of progress based on a methodology that I find incredibly rigorous and compelling and better than anybody else that I've read. So, uh, I actually think I actually think I'm coming to a point now where uh, there's a few big questions I need to sort out. God is, of course, a big one. How to kind of get that clear? But I'm I'm actually transitioning right now to a period of writing where I'm going to write about the conclusions after a decade of introspection and more than that now, I guess, at this point. Um, and then I think I am going to keep moving on. I, I, I thought philosophy was going to be this indefinite thing, but now I'm finding oh, you can make progress in philosophy, you can make conclusions in philosophy. And it doesn't need to keep being rehashed. This is something I've actually struggled with in my personal life, uh, with relation with my relationship with uh, with my wife, because I've also discovered some truths about the importance of love that I have treated as if they are kind of sterile academic truths. The analogy I use is: I I've discovered a truth. Okay, I put it in my. It's like an arrow in my quiver, and I keep searching for more truth to put in my quiver. That's, that's a fine methodology for maybe most truths when it's abstract and nothing important. But when there are truths like the most important thing in the world is that you get yourself into love mindset, <laughs> that's not an area you want to put your quiver. That's an area you want to go, oh, wow, I found it. That, 
that's actually really important. I need to remind myself that that's something that's it should drive my life. Uh, and sometimes I, I, it's hard for me to do that because in the process of putting arrows in my quiver. So uh, that's a long way of saying I think the opposite is going to happen. I, I think I've discovered enough arrows where my burning curiosity about some of these um, issues is actually being answered in a way that I find compelling. And I've said from the beginning, you know, this, this, my work is, in, is for me. I'm pursuing truth for me. I'm doing my writing for me. I'm trying to make money so that I can keep doing it so that I can figure out the truth and then I can try to communicate it to people who are interested in it. So if I'm at the point where I feel like I've found quite a lot of them out, I'm going to communicate them and then, hey, I'm, I don't know, I might be, a, might be a chess player, a musician, I don't know. We'll see. I got another decade in front of me already of work, but after that, I really have no idea what's going to happen. All right, let me go back to my uh, other set of questions. <sighs> Do you really not believe in circles? <laughs> That's the best question ever. That uh, gets the award. Um, so I am very glad that on these things I get to talk about math and the metaphysics of math because just it's a fascinating topic and it's not talked about enough. Um, I, my position on circles is that I simply don't believe in one circle. I believe in the existence of a plurality of circles. And I, I believe in one less circle than most people. And this circle that I don't believe in has remarkable properties, like nobody's ever experienced it. Nobody's ever seen it. Nobody's ever really clearly visualized it, or I would even say clearly conceived of it. Uh, all of the objects we see here, I've got a, this, for example, this mysterious object. It's not a circle. Nay, nay. This is some other, this is some crude thing. I don't know. This is not a circle. Um, by standard orthodox um, mathematical reasoning, the perfect circle is the only real circle. There's only one of them out there, and it's got all these magical properties. Like, for example, the, the ratio of the perfect circles. Uh, diameter to its circumference is pi. And what is the exact value of pi? Well, you see, nobody actually knows. <laughs> it's never been clearly determined. It's still a work in progress. But, this, but the ratio exists and the circle still exists, even though nobody's ever seen it. Um, I don't buy that story. So I have a different conception of mathematics, that mathematics describes the phenomena we experience like every other area of thought. And if your mathematics does not describe any phenomena that we could ever experience, that's a problem with the mathematics and the metaphysics. That's not a problem with an alternative theory. So I have a belief that circles um, are unique. They are constructed from a finite number of units, a finite number of base units, just like every other object. When you see circles on your computer screen, they're composed of pixels. When you see squares, they're composed of pixels. Every other object you've ever seen has made up a part a finite number of parts. So if it's the case that all shapes are made up of a finite number of parts, then there is no such thing as a perfect circle. It's not a coherent concept. And so I don't believe in that circle. Now, the crazy thing is, as completely reasonable and debatable as that idea is, that is treated as if it is uh, the craziest thing you can conceive of. To say that there is no perfect circle or to say that pi is a rational number because it's discrete for any given particular circle is seen as like being a flat earther. It's even worse than that. It's like, oh man, you, you alternative theory of mathematics, what are, you, what are you crazy? What are you nuts? I think this is kind of a leftover. I think uh, math is this one area that did not uh, did not meet the sunshine in, in, in uh, the Enlightenment. I think it's just a staggering amount of dogma. I could talk people's ear off about that. But no, I do not believe in the perfect circle. I believe in actual circles. Okay, next question. Do you, do you think that at some fundamental level, chemistry and physics blend together? Uh, I would say at some, yes. Um, but I would say at a more fundamental level, the way that I conceive of the physical world is as a system of a finite number of bits that are interacting with one another according to a certain set of laws. And so all physical phenomena can be completely reduced to the change in position and state of fundamental units of space-time. So 
um, I would say that chemistry is a way of describing how physical phenomena changes uh, uh, in the physical system. Physics in general is a way of, unless you're talking about quantum physics at the Planck scale, uh, physics can be understood as talking about changes in the position and state of uh, matter. I would even, I would say the same thing about um, you know biology, maybe about psychology, about like brain structures that I, it can all be reduced in the physical system to changes in position state. Um, now, that being said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a metaphysical pluralist, uh, or at least at least a dualist, I guess. Where I don't, where I think there is more at play in life. So I think there are conscious systems, mental systems that are not reducible to changes in position and state of of matter. I don't think that the brain produces consciousness. I think that there's a relationship between the brain and consciousness, but it's not something in the physical system. It's not it's not physical. And I'm open to the idea of there being other kinds of um, uh, realms. So there's there's the physical system, the physical realm, there's the mental realm, maybe there's other types of realms. Maybe there's a spiritual realm, maybe. Maybe there's the, uh, another one we can't even think of. I'm, I'm open to all. I don't have a positive belief in the existence of realms that I can't conceive of because I can't conceive of them, um, but it's a possibility. <clears throat> and actually, that's going to be a big part of the mind in the world, the, book I'm, the other book on metaphysics I'm writing, is reducing the physical system entirely position and state. Um, of units of matter in space time. Okay. Do you know if there is solid arguments to the Big Bang theory and string theory? Do you share those theories? Um, so there's definitely solid arguments to the to the Big Bang theory that, that the universe came into existence. Um, so yes, I think that the universe, I think that the space time came into existence. Uh, and string theory it depends on what you mean by string theory. String theory is kind of a bundle concept. Um, uh, and no, I, I don't have I don't have sophisticated enough analysis to say that I think string theory is plausible or not. I mean, I have such radical disagreements with the fundamentals of mathematics and the relationship of mathematics in the world. I would not be surprised at all if it's the case that um, string theory is a load of hogwash, just like a lot of it, pure mathematics is. But I don't know. I mean, it might not be. There's an area right now that, uh, that anybody is interesting, uh, interested that I'm researching called loop quantum gravity, which is a theory of uh, kind of discrete space-time, which solves a bunch of problems and doesn't include infinities. Um, and that's, that's a physical theory that I find very plausible. Okay. Other questions? We've got a few more still. Have you read Homo Deus by Yuval Harari? Do you have any thought? Uh, no, I have not. Do you have any thoughts on how AI would rationalize or think or when a broad AI comes into existence? That's a great question, actually. I do have thoughts on that. You know, uh, when I spent some time over in Silicon Valley talking with rationalists over there, everybody's worried about AI taking over the world. Oh, my gosh. Um, nobody, so everybody kind of had this assumption that what we think of as reasoning is definitely 100% reducible to computation. And I just don't find that compelling. I think there's a huge part of reasoning which is conceptual. I mean, maybe all of reasoning is conceptual. And I have not seen evidence that there is conceptual reasoning on computational systems. Now, you can, you can kind of get maybe pass Turing tests. Like, you can make a, a system based on computation that gives the appearance of internal conceptualizing. Maybe. I mean, sure, why not? But the idea that, you know, independent conceptual reasoning is something that can be programmed into artificial intelligence. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's even possible, especially being a dualist. I think there's mental phenomena there. Do you believe that he, that the biological human become will become redundant and could be a non-biological rational being, have similar revelations about <laughs> the love concept you, uh, you said recently? Beep boop, he says. <laughs> uh, I think... Look, in the long run, I think our current biological state will be completely irrelevant and completely archaic. I mean, I, I, in the longest of runs, yeah, I think we're going to... Uh, here's, here's my mixture of um, economics and futurism and religion. Um, I think that in the long run, we are going to be love manufacturing devices. I think we're going to be able to assemble matter into a particular state that yields particular structures that yield love. So we're going to be like transforming cosmos this like love generator. I would say the cosmos is kind of already a rough love generator <laughs> uh, but we're going to make it more fine tuned that's that's my, my idea of maybe heaven or something which beverage do you prefer milk or orange juice 
neither right now, let me tell you. Avoiding dairy and avoiding the sugars that are in orange juice, but I, uh, I like orange juice a lot. I'm a fan of Magnus Carlsen, the best chess player in the world. He's an OJ guy, so there's probably something to it. All right, how does praxeology fit into your epistemology? Good question. It seems consistently impossible to acknowledge the validity of the a priori of action and then not work into your epistemology as a key part. That's a good point. I'm not saying you're guilty of this inconsistently. I'm genuinely curious as I've not read your book, so I do not know if you touch upon this. Oh, Nick, you must read this book. Come on now. Um, Praxeology is an interesting one. I actually have a, the next article I'm going to release, I think it's within a month, maybe in a couple of weeks, is going to be called The Abuse of A Priorism in Economics. And I have a position that I've not seen many people take, which is that um, economics is a priori, but it doesn't tell you practically anything about the world. If you want a priorist economics to tell you anything about the world, you have to include empirical assumptions. Um, that being said, so here's what I think about, you know, the, the action axiom. I was listening to a lecture. I don't remember if it was in person when I was working for Fee or if it was I was editing it and I was just listening to it when I was working for Fee. Anyways, it was Israel Kirzner. And Israel Kirzner was talking about his conversations with Mises because I believe Kirzner was a student of Mises. And they were talking about human action and Mises was working through the fundamentals, the fundamental logical arguments. And Kirzner said, well, why do you believe that humans act? And Mises' response, according to Kirzner, was we observe that humans act. That, I think, Mises is correct. And so uh, a lot of a priorist thing wouldn't say that. They'd say it's necessary that humans act because if you deny it, it is, it is itself an action and therefore you've affirmed it. Um, let me give you my thought on that, because it's really interesting. Um, I think that human action, as laid out by Mises, and those, con those are concepts. Those are, those are conceptual analytical tools that we apply to interpret the phenomena that we experience as human action. So, in other words, I don't actually see human action itself. What I see is color blobs in my visual field when I see people walking around. And I make a bunch of conceptual inferences about my beliefs, about what types of objects are in the world and how they interact. And if one of those color blobs meets the conceptual criteria of me calling a human, I say, oh, these creatures act in accordance with their beliefs and their ideas and their choices. And they make decisions because they have a scarce amount of ends that they meet with a scarce amount of means. Um, but that interpretation could be wrong. So maybe it's the case that the color blobs I'm seeing in my visual field is a hallucination. And I'm not actually seeing human action. Um, I don't know. So I'm with Mises on this, which is that you, you develop the a priori conceptual structure to explain the phenomena that you experience, and you keep an open mind as to whether or not the conceptual structure applies to the world. Excellent question, though, and I, uh, I love this topic. All right. Uh, just heard the Magnus Carlsen comment, are you a chess aficionado? Yeah, I am, very much so. Um, I, I love chess. Chess helped me learn about philosophy and truth. I think it was Bobby Fischer said that the, really the purpose, of uh, the purpose of playing chess is to discover truth. I think that's beautiful. I think there's a lot of truth to it. Um, I think that you learn, you learn so much in chess. You learn about uh, truth and falsehood. You learn about careful logical deduction. You learn about certainty in epistemology and methodology. Um, it's fun. You exercise your brain. Um, I'm very much, a, very much a chess fan. All right. I have reached the bottom of the comment section. Any other comments? Uh, let me see if, let me go to my list and see if I have any more. I don't have any more from my patrons. Any more questions from you guys? We've been going at it for an hour, so that was good. All right. Thanks for, thanks for sticking in there, sticking with me. Let's, I'll leave it for um, maybe another couple minutes, and then we'll call it a night. All right, this question, do you have any thoughts on war at this time of humanity? Mm, I do. I do actually have thoughts. Some not-so-nice thoughts that I'm, I'm working out. Uh, so... Uh, it might be the case that 
human psychology is the root of a lot of evil. Humans, you might say, um, but human psychology, where when humans are looking for an explanation for why their lives are poor, they don't look within. They don't observe their minds. They don't think. They don't think clearly. They look externally for scapegoats, for some external reason for the problems in their life. And if that goes on for long enough, and if it's supported by enough people in a society, or maybe in the broader culture, academia, government, um, I think tensions and confusions might build until you're just kind of a natural point in which war breaks out. So I wouldn't be surprised in the states if we have something like a something like a civil war within the next 20 years, based entirely on human psychology and uh, the abandonment of reason and kind of cultural forces that people aren't in control of that, that um, bring people together and then make them stab each other. So I think it's tragic, but, um, but I do think it's possible. In terms of international war, and I don't know, the trouble is when you have these large centralized governments uh, with nukes, uh, you have, I mean, you, literally the circumstances that you have some of the most sociopathic people on, on planet Earth in control of the most dangerous weapons that have ever been created that are also ha have like um, insecurity about the size of their genitals and they're always in dick contests trying to feel better about themselves and raise themselves up the social ladder as politicians. So that seems like a, that seems like a circumstance in which you could have some bad things happen given given a long enough time frame. Um, so I don't know. I was just talking to my wife about this. Um, you know what what does a peaceful intellectual do in times where you know things make it ugly? And I think maybe what you do is you flee. So maybe maybe the smart thing to do if you suspect war is just be like, hey, I gotta uproot myself and uh, find a more peaceful you know, more peaceful place. Ride it out. You know, have the next cycle, and then you have a you know a long set of time where things are violent. All right. We got other thoughts, but they don't. They're, they're, they're still in, in development. All right. Another question. What do you think of the golden rule? Treat others the way you want to be treated. Cannot almost any action be boiled down to self-interest? Oh, two questions. So what do I think of the golden rule? Um, I think it is a, a, I, the best distillation of morality ever. Um, I think it's brilliant. I think it's rational. I think if you live by it, if you're a big person, big on morality, that you live a moral life. If you're a person who's big on kind of consequences, you live a, you live a, 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 a life of economic flourishing. Where people work together and do unto others as they would have others do unto themselves. Um, it results in peace, prosperity, harmony. Uh, I would say a good recipe for love. <laughs> so I'm a big fan. Of, I'm a big fan of the golden rule. Um, I would also say, though, as as a as a partial aside, as my, some of my thoughts about Christianity and God and religion have grown from these experiences that I've had, um, I found there's a there's a very dogmatic rejection of a lot of religious ideas that intellectuals in our current culture uh, go through. It's very natural, you know. You grow up in a, in a religious household, you discover it's a bunch of hogwash. You get rid of it and make fun of it the rest of your life. That's like a normal story that people go through. But unfortunately, they might be throwing out the baby with the bathwater there because a, a great example of there, there being truth to be found in religion just understood a little bit differently is uh, there's, a part, there's a part in the Bible where it says it's describing love. And I've heard it a million times growing up. And my mother loved it, uh, this part. It says something like, love is patient, love is kind. It does not give into anger, blah, 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 blah. Everybody's heard that. So I heard it a million times growing up as a Christian evangelical, and I and I heard that as somebody telling me to do something, like it's prescriptive, like you should be loving, you should be kind, you shouldn't do this, you should do that. I never found that particularly uh, compelling. Then I had the love experience, and I realized, oh no 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 no, I've totally misunderstood. I've just I've thrown out the baby with the bathwater. That particular part of the Bible is is describing love. It's not prescribing anything. So the way that I might explain it is, um, if you have seen or experienced this thing called love, you will understand it as love because it is patient, it is kind, it does not give, give into anger and whatever the list is. It's 
purely describing the state rather than prescribing any kind of rules. Um, so I think that so I think that can be understood more generally with um, a morality and religion in general. Is there's these rules that maybe they aren't prescriptive, maybe they're descriptive. Okay, that was a bit of an aside. Last question: Can almost any action cannot almost any action be boiled down to self-interest? Uh, there is a there is a there's a framework. Um, you know, a rational actor theory, which says that everybody is fundamentally acting rationally, which could be understood as acting in your own self-interest. Um, so you can understand it. Yeah, you can understand it that way. I think. I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think the rational actor theory is is uh, is very powerful. All right. Two more questions. <clears throat> Any thoughts on? Elon Musk, is he the next Da Vinci? <laughs> Will he make real changes or is he only a good lobbyist? Good question. Uh, I don't know that much about Elon Musk, but what, from what I understand, I, I think he's uh, an autodidact, which I appreciate. If I remember correctly, he, he's described part of his work, maybe this is like in his Twitter account, as something like you know, starting over from first principles to do what he's doing and learn what he's learning. I love that. I mean, I'm all about starting over from first principles, definitely. So I like that part. Um, I'm not a big fan of government subsidies at all. I, I think he's very much an excellent lobbyist. In fact, what I think he does better than anybody, this doesn't sound nice, but I think it's true, is he knows how to market to people that are easily impressed by tech ideas. So the Hyperloop, right, this, this incredibly economically inefficient technology, it's called the Hyperloop, and it's so cool, and we could get from L. San Francisco in 20 minutes or whatever the heck it is. Um, never mind the, like, you make a cool picture, you make a cool name, and suddenly, oh, you got a billion dollars of government financing. Or, like, <laughs> yeah, there's the battery thing, like the wall of batteries in your house. Is it economically efficient? Maybe not, but it's such a cool idea, you know, so that he gets government funding for it. So um, I don't particularly like that. But, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't have other strong I know a lot of libertarians don't like him for the subsidy thing but I, I don't have enough knowledge or strong enough opinions to say much more about that all right any other questions I hear my voice getting a little bit hoarse so I'm gonna be ending it soon one way or another any last questions thanks again guys this has been fun it's been good the questions anything else no don't be shy. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, I, I thanks for the comment, too. Whoever said it, oh, we, we've got another question, so I'll answer it. Um, oh, two questions. Okay. See, so you guys were shy. Uh, well, shout out to whoever said it. I should do this more. I should do it on Facebook Live more. I think you'd be right. I think this is a good platform. I mean, the only YouTube platform screwed up, so this one is better. Uh, all right. Another, another two questions. Left, leftist collectivists based in critical theory are creating the act groups like the alt right, therefore summoning the devil. Oh, uh, summoning the devil they chant for. Uh, yes, I was just talking about this the other day. Um, so yes, I do think that the the social justice people are literally creating the enemies. They're literally creating enemies where there are none. So the whole Nazi thing. Ain't nobody in this country practically that was a Nazi a couple of years ago. I mean, little, little Nazi. No way in hell. I mean, it's not, it's just silly. I mean, of course, the handful is always acceptance. But the idea of this being anything worth worthy of respect wasn't even on the table. Well, now what all these social justice warriors have done is they have screamed this name. They said, Nazis are the enemy. You're a bunch of Nazis. You're a bunch of Nazis. Nazis are the enemy. Or now they've told a bunch of people who are mad at the social justice warriors for good reason that if you are opposed to being a social justice warrior, maybe you're a Nazi. If you want to drive social justice warriors crazy, you're a Nazi. Well, that's very enticing to people who really don't like the social justice warriors. So suddenly, these people are, are literally creating enemies where they were It's not just about Nazism, it's about uh, the alt-right, it's about um, any of the figurative people that they, they conjure up as being the, the cause of social ills. I think they are, in fact, creating... Uh, unfortunately, it's tragic. All right. All right, so that wasn't a question. That was just a statement. I think it is time for me to get some food in my belly. This has been great. 
Thank you guys so much. And uh, yeah, how to sign off? I should have thought of a sign off. Hope you all are going to have a good day. Or uh, actually, if you guys were interested in talking about Bitcoin, Bitcoin, I've got a killer interview coming out this Sunday, which goes into great detail uh, about why you, it's going to be called Watch Out for Bitcoin Cash. So if, if you're interested in crypto, make sure you tune in this Sunday. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one if I can figure out how to end this live video. There we are.